mention to you that next week we're going to be doing ordinations for the pastors. And uh, if you don't know what that is, you're going to learn more about it, especially next Sunday. Uh, we have several pastors here, and uh, several years ago we licensed uh, four men to preach, to be pastors, and uh, so it is, it is time to go ahead and make some things official, to recognize some things, and do that ordination. Because when it comes down to it, it's about, it's about committing our life every area of our life, to Jesus. So last week we started talking about commitment. And I want to talk some more about commitment today. And I know some of it may seem like it's redundant or repetitive. But I guess, I guess I'm doing this for myself more than anybody else. I don't want you to think that I'm judging you, that I don't think that you're committed. I do. But I think we need reminded of it. I know I need reminded of it. I need reminded of it often. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, let's start in Luke chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke chapter 5. We're going to go through the first 11 verses. You're familiar with this passage, but we're going to look at it in a little different way. Dr. Luke writes this. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. We say that we're committed. We say that we're committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I guess my question is, how committed is that? I mean, total commitment means that Jesus Christ is Lord in every area of our lives. He must be Lord on Saturday night as well as Sunday morning. He must be Lord of our bodies as well as our brains. He must be the Lord of what we save as well as what we sacrifice. He must be Lord of our careers as well as our creed. Are we totally committed to Jesus? Is He really the Lord of everything? Is He the Lord of all? You see, at the beginning of Luke chapter 5 here, we, we, we see that Peter is is on the beach. He's washing his fishing nets. He's he's preparing them. He didn't catch anything that day, so he's washing the nets. He's getting them prepared so he can go out the next day or the next time and catch something. But when we get down to the last verse, when we get down to verse 11, we see that Peter has left his boats. He's left his nets. 
He's left everything to follow Jesus. The miracle of the great catch of fish has resulted in a miracle in the life of Peter. The step towards total commitment that we see from Peter are steps that every growing Christian, every person that's growing in their relationship with Jesus, every person that is a disciple of Jesus must take as well. The first step that we see here is getting involved. Because Peter, Peter was willing to let Jesus use his boat. <laughs> in Luke chapter 4, uh, it indicates that Peter already knew Jesus. He knew Jesus at this time. But up until now, up until Luke chapter 5, until this moment, up until now, Peter had been content to just hear the word of God from Jesus, to just, just listen to Jesus while going about his everyday normal living. There wasn't much that changed in Peter's life, not before this. What a picture that is of a lot of Christians. They know the Lord, yes. They're willing to listen to God's Word, yes. But there isn't much that is changed in their lifestyle. There's not much change that results from what they hear from God's Word. There's not much change in their life as a result of their relationship with Jesus. In fact, a lot of times from watching their lives, it's hard to differentiate Christians from non-Christians because everybody's just the same trying to get ahead in the world. Most of us are just washing our nets, preparing for tomorrow's catch, just barely within hearing distance of God's Word. But then we see this from Peter. We see him take a step in the right direction. He turns his boat over to Jesus. We have to be willing to turn over what we have, what we own to Jesus for his use. Because there are things that we own, things that, 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 that take our focus, things that we're invested in. We own stuff and we own time, we own talent. But are we willing to share all of those things? The things that have been such a help to us. Are we willing to turn them over to Jesus? Are we willing to allow God to use the things that we have, the things that we own for His purposes? Are we willing to make time for His use? What about that teenager that needs a little bit of attention, that teenager who needs somebody to, to sit down and, and, and listen to them, that teenager that has a tendency of, of disrupting schedules or draining precious time? Are we willing to invest our abilities, our talents, our gifts? Or should we just go on hoarding them? Are my abilities available in some way for Jesus' use? Or do I just use them to bring glory to myself? It's hypocrisy to speak of total commitment to Christ when we're not willing to turn over our boat. The next step that Jesus wants us to learn about total commitment is just what he told Peter to do. Push out from shore. Take a step off of the beach. Push the boat out just a little. I mean, it's one thing to take what we own and, and to make it available for, for Jesus' use, but it's another thing to step out by faith from the security of the land, from the security of our comfort zone. Let's not only open our home for a Bible study. Why don't we push to actually start a Bible study? Let's not only make our weekends available or our Sundays available, available for Jesus. Let's actually help in children's church or, 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 or attend a table talk or, or help with a community event. Let's not only give our small savings for spreading the good news, let's actually verbalize the gospel ourselves. Let's actually talk to somebody about Jesus. Yeah, it takes faith and it takes courage to push out a little. There's a risk. There's a sacrifice involved. But that's what pushing out from land 
from security is all about. The Lord Jesus doesn't force Peter to turn over his boat. He doesn't force him to push out. I mean, he asks him to do it. I mean, think about this. Jesus could have just walked out on the water without any use of a boat at all, but he didn't. He wanted Peter to get involved. He wanted Peter to get a piece of the action, and he chooses to teach people out of Peter's boat. He chooses to use Peter. God will teach us here that he delights to use us for his glory if we just step out a little bit by faith. But we love the security of the land. And so we're reluctant to move away from the shore. (laughs) How can we talk about total commitment to Jesus if we're not willing to push out a little? But there's one more step toward total commitment. Total commitment. We find it in verse 4 where Jesus tells Peter to put out to the deep water. Launch into the deep. Now here's total dependence on Jesus. No more land. No more shallow water. No more more safety of the shore. It is here where commitment is no longer a sideline. In many ways, it's a point of no return. I mean, my education and career are no longer planned with the comfort of solid ground in view. My, my, my field of work and study are determined by God's will for my life, not mine. It is no longer a question of what career will give me the greatest return or security or peace or chance for advancement in this world. It is now a matter of my education, my career, my choice of life partner, my retirement, my all being subject to the Lordship of Jesus. Am I still playing at token efforts in the shallow water of Christian commitment? Or have I launched out into the deep? It is in the deep that we experience God's power. We learn that He really does provide in in a miraculous way for the very needs that may have held us back from total commitment. We may work all night to make it in this life and still catch nothing. But the person who is totally committed to Jesus doesn't sweat the needs of this life. He or she knows that if they seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these things will be provided. It is in the deep that we learn to worship. Jesus is no longer just a friend invited into my life. He is Lord of my life. He is God. When Peter experienced the Lord's power in the deep, he wasn't just amazed. He fell down before Jesus and he confessed, I am a sinful man, Lord. The more committed we are to Jesus, the more we are aware of his sinfulness and his holiness. What a blessing to know that that Jesus doesn't depart from us, that He never leaves us, that He never forsakes us, but He he comforts us and He transforms us. He, He changes us and He uses us. And He promises us, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Peter had reached the point of no return. He left everything to follow his Lord. Yes, There were failures yet to come in Peter's life. Total commitment doesn't mean perfection. Total commitment doesn't mean that we know everything. It's a matter of taking self off the throne of life and enthroning Christ in your life. So I ask you, how committed are you to Jesus? Have you just pushed out a little? Or have you launched into the deep? Or maybe you're still just hung up on the beach. Total commitment means that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is Lord, period. Now in a moment, I'm going to ask you a question. But first, I want you to find a few people to greet with a hug, a handshake, or a high five. And I want you to tell them that we're going to talk some more about total commitment. Go ahead.
Where are you now when darkness seems to end? Where are you now when the world is crumbling? Oh, I, I, I hear you say, I hear you say. As you're making your way back to your seats, before I pray, let me share one more prayer request with you. Uh, Cheyenne Payne is, is here, but uh, her daughter is uh, at the hospital at Akron General. Uh, her name is Victoria, and Shy doesn't know why she's there. Uh, she's going to go find out after church, but in the meantime, we need to remember her in prayer also. Would you bow your heads? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity of being here this morning. Lord, first, we seek your forgiveness for anything that would be a barrier, a hindrance between us and you. Anything that would prevent your Holy Spirit from working in our lives, from revealing what you have for us. Father, we seek your forgiveness. We repent from our sin and we ask that you would help us to not sin, to not be disobedient to you. And then, Father, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your instruction. We ask for uh, your revelation in, in what you want us to learn, what you want us to change in our life, what you want us to do, uh, everything, Lord. And, Father, uh, we also ask that you're with Shia's daughter right now, Victoria, that you are protecting her, that you are guiding the doctors, that you are helping them uh, heal her. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's the question. And again, it sounds repetitive. It sounds redundant. But what are you committed to? What are you committed to? I mean, there are close to 100 million church members across this country, across America, and yet... 
Why are we not making more of a moral and a spiritual impact in our culture, in our society, in our, in our country? Why is it that on Sunday morning, hundreds of churches have empty pews? Why are, are so many churches having just a few at, at, at their services on Wednesday night? Why is that? Now, God knows if you can't be at church for whatever reason, and He knows the reason, and if you could be here and you're not, He knows that too. The Holy Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God, and yet why is it that so few Christians read it? I mean, if God is a, is a prayer-answering God, and He is, and if he meant for us to ask, seek, and knock, then why is so little praying going on? If you and I believe there is a heaven and a hell, why do we keep so quiet about sharing the gospel? Why aren't we talking about Jesus more with people that need to hear about Jesus? If we believe that there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved, then why are we not sharing the message of His saving grace? I'll tell you why. Because we talk a, a good talk when it comes to commitment. But the reality is, we lack it. We lack real commitment. It doesn't show through our lives the way it could, the way it should. Hmm. Psalm 37 verses 1 through 5 says, Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong, for like grass they soon fade away. Like spring flowers they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and, and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and He will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him and He will help you. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. Commitment. What are you committed to? Hmm. Before we close this morning, I want to talk to you about the three C's of commitment. These are kind of a review of the closing questions that we had last week. But I want to go through them again. I want to spend some more time with them again. I want to review some more Scripture verses again about commitment. Three C's of commitment. The first one is be committed to God. Be committed to God. Hmm. Let me give you some simple verses for why we must be committed to God. John 3.16, you know it. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Mark chapter 12, verse 30, you know it. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Matthew chapter 6, 33, you know it. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Be committed to God means all of the time. 
in everything. A real commitment doesn't have an, an on and an off switch. A real commitment is not a, just a Sunday morning kind of a thing or, or a Wednesday dinner kind of a thing. It's 24 hours a day. It's seven days a week. It's 365 days a year with no vacations and no days off. That's the kind of thing that being committed to God is. If you are really committed to God, it's going to show because you will be the same person Monday through Saturday as you are sitting in the pew on Sunday morning. And others will see the fruits, the results of your commitment. Be committed to God. Second, be committed to family. Is it little wonder that 50% of all marriages in this country, whether they're Christian or non-Christians, end in divorce? No. No. Kids grow up not seeing any commitment in their family. And then they just pass it on. They don't see commitment from their parents. Husbands and wives. How long has it been since you took each other in your arms and kissed each other deeply? Not just a peck on the way out the door. Love you. See you later. Took each other in your arms and kissed passionately, deeply, and looked into each other's eyes and said, I love you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. When was the last time you just took time away to spend with each other? When's the last time that you just bought your spouse a gift for no reason at all? When was the last time <laughs> that you celebrated your marriage? Not just on your anniversary. <laughs> you can celebrate your love for each other every day. How about your mom or your dad or your sister or your brother or your kids? Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 16 says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you. When's the last time you let your parents know how much they mean to you? When's the last time you let them know how thankful you are for all that they've done for you, all that they've sacrificed? You see, we teach our family by our example. The Bible defines the way a family should be in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, where it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. You say a husband has no problem loving a submissive wife. And a wife has no problem being submissive to a loving husband. And children will love and honor parents who love them and teach them according to the Bible. Be committed to God. Be committed to your family. And then third, be committed to your church. Now, being committed to your church consists of four things that I want to go through. First, being committed to your church means being committed to church attendance. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, You should not stay away from the church meetings, as some are doing, but you should meet together and encourage each other. Do this even more as you see the day coming, the day when Jesus returns. Does your family need to ask when they get up on Sunday mornings, are we, are we going to church today? <laughs> mm. If they do, there's a problem. Too many people become afflicted with that epidemic known as Sundayitis. <laughs> I can't. 
I better go back to bed. I might be coming down with something instead of going to church. If that happened on a Monday morning, you just grab a hanky and go to work. But for some reason, we get sick easier on Sunday, I guess. Sometimes we're just too tired to be involved. Sometimes we're just too busy to help out. I mean, sometimes on Wednesday there's just too many things going on in my life, so I just can't go. I found out that when there are too many things in my life, God has a way of taking them, some of those things away. Especially my excuses. To be committed to your church is to be committed to attending, to being involved. The second, being committed to your church means being committed to church growth, the church growing and you growing with it. I mean, how many people did you talk to this week about Jesus? I mean, I, I, I know if you reflect back over your week, you could think of a multitude of conversations that you had with people, but how many of those conversations included Jesus? How many people did you actually talk to about how Christ is working in your life? How many friends did you invite to come to church with you this week? Oh, I didn't have time. Well, that's not being committed to church or church growth. Also, to be committed to your church means that you need to be committed to your church's needs. The needs of your church. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, we read this. Well, will, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, God says. But, but you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, your offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I know you're thinking, uh uh-oh, there's that tithing word. Now he's going to be talking about offerings and giving more money to the church. Well, we need to be committed to giving to the church. But it's more than just tithes and offerings. It's supporting the church. It's supporting uh, with our love, our prayers, our time, our availability, and our finances. The ministries and the programs that we have around here don't happen by themselves. So yes, we do need to be committed. We need to be committed to our church in attendance. We need to be committed to our church in growth. We need to be committed to our church's needs. Let me tell you a story using four typical church members. I'll name them for you. They're everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. I I, want to tell you this story, but I need some volunteers. I, I need four volunteers. Just come on up here. Yeah. Four, hop up right off the bat. I love volunteers like this. Just stand right across the front and face the congregation and, and hold your sign. But here's what I want you to do. Become familiar with your name on the sign. Everybody, somebody, anybody, nobody. Now, when I, when I call your name, just hold your sign up and down, okay? Let's practice. Nobody. A little faster, please. (laughs) Nobody. Somebody. Everybody. Anybody. Ah, here we go. Are you ready? Okay. Let me tell you this story. There was an important job to do, and everybody thought that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, 
but none of them did. Ah, uh, hey, watch it. <laughs> and it didn't get done. Somebody got angry because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought for sure that somebody would do it, but nobody asked anybody. In the end, the job wasn't done and everybody blamed somebody and nobody asked anybody. Yay! <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Now all you bodies go sit down. The point of the little story is this. Trust God and just do it. I mean, He's the one that gives the increase. So when it comes to being committed to your church, we have church attendance, we have church growth, we have church needs. And the fourth one is soul winning. Man, that sounds like an archaic word almost. I haven't heard that for a long time. Soul winning. Be committed to winning souls Introducing people to Jesus. Proverbs 11 verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Matthew 28 verse 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know, I know some people, they think, oh, I can't talk to people about Jesus. I just get too nervous or embarrassed or afraid. It's funny how we don't have a problem talking about anything else. I know there are some people that are thinking, well, I, I don't know enough about the Bible. I'm, I'm not really that educated in the Bible. Well, whose fault is that? Huh? Huh? I mean, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. You think that verse was just written for a few of us? It's written for every single one of us. James chapter 5, or chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask of God, who gives generously to all. All, everyone, without finding fault. And it will be given to you. James chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 says, You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. Matthew chapter 7, verse 8. For everyone that asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Hmm. Each and every one of us needs to be committed to God, to our family, to our church. We need to be committed to coming, to church growth, to the needs of our church, and to winning souls, bringing people and introducing them to Jesus. What are you committed to? Because when you think about it, life boils down to commitment. So how are you doing? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity of this morning. Thank you for the freedom to worship you. Father, sometimes I know my freedom gets in the way of my commitment. Maybe, Lord, if you would just take some of my choices away and help me be more committed or make me be more committed. Oh, no. That's not the way you work in my life, God. You give me freedom of choice. You gave me a free will. And you did that because you want me to choose to love you. You want me to choose to obey you. You want me to choose to commit all of me to you. That's how much you love me. And that's how much you want me to love you. Lord, help us to love you the way you designed us to love you. 
Help us to be committed. Lord, help us to surrender. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing that hymn, I Surrender All.